Fresh off the heels of their third straight Big Ten title, the Iowa Hawkeyes are rolling. This is after suffering some pretty bad defeats against the likes of Ohio State, Nebraska, and Indiana. Each of these teams took on a strategy to stop Caitlin Clark from going off by pretty much throwing everything you could possibly throw at her. I broke this down in another video, so check that out, but now it's tournament time, and with this being Clark's last college season, they have to be anxious to go out with a bang. So much is talked about when it comes to Caitlin Clark's legacy and where she ranks as an all-timer in the college realm. I don't think anyone is expecting them to win it all with the teams that's been dominating so far this season. And after Caitlin has lost her most consistent number two option in Monica Sonato from last season's team, it's been a work in progress to get secondary production. But lately, things have been looking up because everyone has sort of been stepping up and playing by committee. So for this video today, I wanted to take a look at how might Iowa be able to overcome some of the more scary teams that they may ultimately face off if they have a deep run. The teams that I believe Iowa doesn't want to see unless they absolutely have to in the championship are UCLA, Stanford, and the two teams they faced off against last year in LSU and South Carolina. These teams pose significant challenges to this Iowa team, and with Iowa, you kind of want everything to go as perfectly as possible to get your best shot possible at a title. As for Caitlin Clark's career, she still needs a Final Four appearance, in my opinion, to kind of validate this season and her rank as a player. So without further ado, I want to give further insight and dive into potential strategies against each of these top teams. UCLA is one of the most interesting teams in women's college basketball. At the start of the season, they were ranked pretty high and they were actually dominating. Over the offseason, Lauren Betts was their primary big transfer and she's just a player that just makes everything work for them. She's a real big presence down low. Her post-up skills are very polished, I would say. And for a team like Iowa, they struggle with big post players that could just outsize them and overwhelm them in the paint. That leads to a situation where the defense is over leveraged and if the team around that interior force has the ability to punish them, then it's over. We will talk about South Carolina later in this video, but that was the thing that ultimately won Iowa the game last year. They were oversized and overwhelmed to the point they over leveraged their defense, but South Carolina didn't have anyone to punish them for it. I'm foreshadowing, but that has changed this year. Now, while UCLA was dominant to start the season, they have kind of been underwhelming since then. They've had some pretty big losses during that stretch and some of that was Lauren Betts going out with an injury and that component really takes away their advantage. But some of the games they dropped, Betts was actually playing and they just had some blunders that you would think a team of their caliber shouldn't have. Still nonetheless, UCLA is still a team that could present Iowa with serious problems if they were to meet. I believe they will because Iowa plays directly into the way that UCLA is built to take advantage of. Obviously, we spoke on the impact of Lauren Betts as she is their first option that can get you to over leverage your defense if you are outsized. Their second option that they look for is the weak or help side because they know you are likely to send a help defender on the post entry from the help side. That will cause you to sink too far in and that's where they typically have London Jones and sometimes Charisma Osborne position. They have the ability to absolutely torch you out on the perimeter and that is a very compromising position to be in if you're the defense. If none of that is there, then they go directly to Charisma Osborne, who is projected to be a first rounder in this upcoming draft. She is able to do a little bit of everything, including creating her own shots. So when the offense boils down, you always have her as an option to get a bucket or a playmate. The last true option is Kiki Rice, who is a big guard that can get downhill and loves to playmake as well. For me, the keys to the game for Iowa should be for them to either go the Stokey route and try to outrun bets. But if that doesn't work, then immediately switch up and get some size in there. I would also see if Betts handles doubles well. They may kill you with their shooters if you pre-rotate, but what happens when you force Betts to be the passer? Per 40, she is averaging 1.3 assists and 3.2 turnovers. That is definitely something that you can attack. I would also attack London Jones and Charisma Osborne, who are 5'4 and 5'9 respectively. If you can get them switched onto Kate Martin and Caitlin Clark and get the refs to blow the whistle, you should be clear and take some of their offense out. As for Stanford, this is a little different because they have two players that could outsize and overwhelm Iowa, but those two players are also extremely versatile and can play from all over the court as bigs. I'm talking about, of course, Cameron Brink and Kiki Irifin. Kiki is very physical and very athletic, but also has a lot of finesse to her game. All of this is packaged into a, an aggressive scorer and rebounder, which is super hard to match up with. I will do a more in-depth breakdown of Cameron Brink later at some point, but the chemistry these two have in the high-low action is very beautiful. They both can play at either position, whether that's Brink at the high post or Irfin at the low post or vice versa. 
They both can make plays from anywhere. For Iowa, the strategy has to be to go big and try to punish Brink because she's pretty light in her core. I would hope with that being the case, O'Grady could see a significant amount of playing time. And if Brink is too preoccupied with battling with O'Grady, then everyone else could drive to the lane. You want to be physical with Brink and go into her chest on offense. Deny the high post and force a catch out at the three-point line. Put Stokey on Kiki Irifin and try to limit her aggressiveness. LSU, the team that would take Iowa out and win the national championship and become one of the biggest moments in women's basketball. And it would be the catalyst for the popularity the sport is seeing as a whole right now. While much was made about what happened after the game or as the game was winding down, not much is actually talked about as far as what happened in the game. For this video, as we focus on how Iowa can cut the strategy to take down teams that I believe are probably the favorites against them, we have to take a further look at that championship game. Iowa coming into that game knew they would be at a disadvantage because of the starting front court that LSU were playing, particularly Andrew Reese and Ladeja Williams. With those two, you basically had two twin towers that could just snag up old boards and play off of each other in the high-low. We all know what Angel Reese brings to the table by now, but Ladeja Williams held it down against big players and could stretch out to at least the mid-range area, while also providing an interior presence on the defensive end. So right away, Iowa was going to try to sell out on their bigs as a strategy. They had succeeded with in the previous round against South Carolina, but the difference was this team had players ready to shoot. Now, Angel Reese had gotten into some foul trouble, and that was persistent throughout the game, and she would finish off with 15 points, which was less than 10 off of her season average. What pretty much set the tone for the game was Flaugier Johnson being confident enough to let it fly from beyond the arc, and that would immediately punish Iowa sinking in too far and trying them as shooters. Things took another turn when Jasmine Carson got into the game, and she went just absolutely nuclear, filling it up from beyond the arc. By that point, and Caitlin Clark herself getting into some foul trouble as well as some of the bigs on Iowa. The game was starting to get out of control, but then Iowa pulled back in, but then Alexis Morris just finished them off by just being the vet closer the team needed. They couldn't guard her at all in the pick and roll, and she just kept running it for the mid-range pull-up. So if Iowa were to run into them again, what should the strategy be? Well, with this LSU team, everything starts with crashing the boards. Although a lot of talent left this squad, the player they would be retaining is none other than Angel Reese. She destroys teams and I believe she is very underrated as a WNBA prospect because of her defense and switchability. They lost Williams, but they picked up Anissa Morrow. And although she is way smaller, there has been no drop off in rebounding or defense because she plays way bigger than her size. I believe Sydney of Walter will be very important in this game because you are going to need hustle players that can come up with the ball on this team. A Fulcher just has a knack for that kind of thing. She is just a pit bull with the level of effort, physicality, and controlled aggressiveness she is able to display. Having her matched up with Morrow or on the wing against someone like a Michaela Williams will be crucial. How I see this LSU team as compared to last year team, Morrow is replacing Alexis Moore's production, but from Williams' play types, meaning she's the true primary option, but she plays more in the high post like Williams. Michaela Williams is replacing... Ladeja Williams production, but from Alexis Morris play types, meaning she is the second or third option and probably even fourth because of Flaugier's ascension, but she operates in the pick and roll similar to Alexis Morris. Van Liff is replacing Jasmine Carson's would-be production, meaning she is the X-factor that can go off at any time. They like to run quick hitters on the second actions to get a duck in, a cut, or a quick shot for their shooters. You want to make it challenging for them to receive the ball and you want to force them to have to create off the dribble. Especially with a player like Morrow, you want to make sure your hands are up and that she isn't catching the ball in positions where she is comfortable. Flaugé is probably the best at this, so you want to have an adequate- Okay guys, so here's a last second voiceover. At the time that I initially did this video, I didn't know the path that Iowa would actually have to take, but now since Selection Sunday, we now have a clear picture of the path that they would need to take to get to the NCAA championship. So some of the teams still stay the same. Um, obviously, um, I'm not really sure if they're going to have to face Stanford because Stanford will have to go through South Carolina. Texas will have to go through South Carolina. Um, but they still will have to face LSU and UCLA. They were kind of dealt with a bad hand. Obviously, Kansas State. And I didn't include Kansas State, but they're still a scary team because obviously they beat Iowa this season earlier in the year. But LSU, UCLA, and South Carolina are still the teams they will have to go through. Those are still the teams, to me, that still pose the most challenges to 
um, Iowa. Now, UConn and USC, they would end up having to meet them if they were to get to the Final Four. But I'm not really too afraid of those teams because they're not that massively um, oversized. So, as far as LSU, getting back into that, I still have the same sentiments from earlier with LSU, UCLA, and South Carolina. But I would like to add that Iowa should really take Flaw J. Johnson seriously and make sure you force her to putting it on the floor and sending help. Make her a mid-range jump shooter and a three-point passer. Make her, you know, pass it out to the three-point line. Um, the reason why I say that is because she plays incredibly fast. And I think she's very underrated. She's taller than she's listed. They got her listed at like 5'10", but she's really closer to like six foot, six one. So she's really somebody that's really going under the radar as far as, you know, how good she is. Um, she may be the second best offensive talent on the team. Um, over Angel Reese. I think, you know, her and maybe um, maybe Anissa Morrow may be better. So I would say, you know, gain rebound and don't let Angel Reese just barrel you down low. I kind of alluded to that already. Don't let Morrow catch the ball in her spots. You know, I alluded to that already. And I would just say I would rather Haley Van Liff and Michaela Williams beat me. If, if I'm going to allow anybody to beat me, let them two beat you. Um, I don't think Haley Van Liff is, you know, if you, if you have her drive into the lane, she's not that great of a finisher. And she's kind of inefficient for, with her jump shot. She's kind of un, unconfident. I wouldn't just leave her open, per se. But I would I would put, like, Caitlin Clark on her and let her, you know. Because I feel like Kim Mulkey wants to go at Caitlin Clark. And, you know, I think if you put her on Van Lift, she's going to empower Van Lift a lot more. And obviously, I would say, uh, you know, with Williams, um, she, I don't know. I, she doesn't go to the rim enough for me so she liked to settle a lot a lot for like mid-range jump shots so i would live with that like that's the offense i would i would live with um I, I would say i don't know who gabby marshall would guard in this instance because um a lot of like they have a lot of size like as far as far as on the wings um like i said Fajay is taller than you know usual then then she's listed um Michaela williams is pretty tall um, anisa morrow she's she's not gonna be able to guard her so I don't know. I think Kylie Fearbach should see a lot more minutes in this game. I think uh, Kate Martin and uh, um, Sydney Fulter obviously will get a lot of minutes. Um, so, yeah, I would say that for LSU. As far as UCLA, um, same strategy, I, I, I would say. But also, their guards don't handle a lot of pressure well. So I would say don't let them just freely set up in their offense. Um, their pace is 70 to IU with 76, so it's not that far off, but I would put, um, they have a clear mismatch, you know what I mean? And they may look to slow the game down further, so it is best to pressure the guards to speed up, kind of speed up their offense and make it challenging to get into their sets. Um, they want to, obviously, like I said, they have a clear mismatch, so they want to get to Lauren Betts. Um, if you can, like, rush their guards and kind of, like, make them take longer to set up in their offense... I think, you know, Lauren Betts don't have that much time to work with. So you she's kind of going to have to scramble for buckets. You know, then you can throw a late double team at her. You know what I mean? Now the, they wasted the whole shot clock. You know what I mean? So I think that would be the strategy I would take for them. Um, and obviously on offense, man, I don't believe they're going to be able to guard Iowa. Um, like I said, if, you know, you got Kate Martin, anybody that could just uh, go at their undersized guards. London Jones is like five foot four, Prisma Osborne five nine. Um, Kiki Rice, she got some size on her. And I think she's the best defender they have on the perimeter. But, you know, she's still, you know, she's still the third um, smallest player on the court. So, I mean, on their team. So, yeah, I would, I would just, you know, do that. I think that would be a pretty good strategy. So, obviously, LSU and UCLA will have to play each other and whoever knocks each other out. I, I would prefer, I don't know. I don't know. I, I've been going back and forth with this, but I would pref I think I would prefer LSU, you know, because they're not as deep. They don't have just this clear mismatch in the post that Iowa seems to struggle with. Um, I think they can match up pretty well this year. I don't know. I don't know. Like I said, if, if you can like take Flaugie Johnson out of the game, if you can gain rebound and, and take away their clear uh, rebound positions, because with Flaugie Johnson, she's able to get downhill. That's that's where she's most dangerous. And you know, once she get there, she's fit, she's doing all type of crazy layups to finish it. And um, Angel Reese, obviously, she cre her and her and Anissa Morrow, they create extra possessions. That's that's their main strength 
is because they can get the ball back, get the ball back, get the ball back on the offensive rebound, and that creates more possession. So now you're, you you know initially they're not that efficient, but it's like because they get so many possessions, they good they can um, really run that offensive score up. So you know, and obviously on their defensive end too, you know they're able to get out in transition. But I, I just like my chances better than, with that. Um, as far as South Carolina, I, I still have the same um, the same strategy. I think I broke that down pretty well. But what I didn't include is I think they should probably throw a zone in there, but get out on the shooters as well. You want them having to think through their offense, which really disrupts the rhythm of shooters. I know Caitlin Clark has experienced this as well. When Caitlin Clark, when they throw certain type of defenses at Caitlin Clark, like a box and one, or they just, you know, face guarding her or whatever, it takes her longer to figure out how to beat this defense. When you're thinking about how to beat a defense rather than how to get a clean look off because you know, you know, you already got advantages so you could just get, you know, your shot off freely, it makes you overthink and that really disrupts the rhythm of a shooter. So I would say, you know, I, I would throw a zone in there at them. Um... I think if you watch, if you go back to South Carolina game against Georgia, they did a really good job throwing that zone. I would do something similar like that. If you if you all want to go back and watch that game against South Carolina with Georgia, so that's it for this one, guys. Um, yeah, that's just my voiceover, and the video will continue from here. Okay, guys, so here's a last second voiceover. At the time that I initially did this video, I didn't know the path that Iowa would actually have to take. But now, since Selection Sunday, we now have a clear picture of the path that they would need to take to get to the NCAA championship. So some of the teams still stay the same. Um, obviously, um, I'm not really sure if they're going to have to face Stanford because Stanford will have to go through South Carolina. Texas will have to go through South Carolina. Um, but they still will have to face LSU and UCLA. They were kind of dealt with a bad hand. Obviously, Kansas State... And I didn't include Kansas State, but they're still a scary team because, obviously, they beat Iowa this season earlier in the year. But LSU, UCLA, and South Carolina are still the teams they will have to go through. And those are still the teams, to me, that still pose the most challenges to um, Iowa. Now, UConn and USC, they will end up having to meet them if they were to get to the Final Four. But I'm not really too afraid of those teams because they're not that massively um, oversized. So, as far as LSU, getting back into that, I still have the same sentiments from earlier with LSU, UCLA, and South Carolina. But I would like to add that Iowa should really take Flaw J. Johnson seriously and make sure you force her to putting it on the floor and sending help. Make her a mid-range jump shooter and a three-point passer. Make her, you know, pass it out to the three-point line. Um, the reason why I say that is because she plays incredibly fast. And I think she's very underrated. She's taller than she's listed. They got her listed at like 5'10", but she's really closer to like six foot, six one. So she's really somebody that's really going under the radar as far as, you know, how good she is. Um, she may be the second best offensive talent on the team um, over Angel Reese. I think, you know, her and maybe, um, maybe Anissa Morrow may be better. So I would say, you know, gain rebound and don't let Angel Reese just barrel you down low. I kind of alluded to that already. Don't let Morrow catch the ball in her spots. You know, I alluded to that already. And I would just say I would rather Haley Van Liff and Michaela Williams beat me. If I'm going to allow anybody to beat me, let them two beat you. Um, I don't think Haley Van Liff is, you know, if you if you have her drive into the lane, she's not that great of a finisher. And she's kind of inefficient for, with her jump shot. She's kind of been un, unconfident. I wouldn't just leave her open, per se, but I would, I would put, like, Caitlin Clark on her. And let her, you know, because I feel like Kim Mulkey wants to go at Caitlin Clark. And, you know, I think if you put her on Van Lift, she's going to empower Van Lift a lot more. And obviously, I would say, uh, you know, with Williams, um, she, I don't know, I, she doesn't go to the rim enough for me. So she liked to settle a lot, a lot for like mid-range jump shots. So I would live with that. Like, that's the offense I would, I would live with. Um, I, I would say... I don't know who Gabby Marshall would guard in this instance because um, a lot of like they have a lot of size like as far as far as on the wings. Um, like I said, Fajay is taller than you know usual. Then then she's listed. Um, Michaela Williams is pretty tall. Um, Anissa Morrow she's she's not gonna be able to guard her. So I don't know. I think Kylie Fairbach should see a lot more minutes in this game. I think uh, Kate Martin and uh, um, Sydney Fulter 
obviously we'll get a lot of minutes. Um, so yeah, I would say that for LSU. As far as UCLA, um, same strategy I, I, I would say, but also their guards don't handle a lot of pressure well. So I would say don't let them just freely set up in their offense. Um, their pace is 70 to IU with 76, so it's not that far off, but I would put, um, they have a clear mismatch, you know what I mean? And they may look to slow the game down further. So it is best to pressure the guards to speed up, kind of speed up their offense and make it challenging to get into their sets. Um, they want to, obviously, like I said, they have a clear mismatch, so they want to get to Lauren Betts. Um, if you can, like, rush their guards and kind of, like, make them take longer to set up in their offense, I think, you know, Lauren Betts don't have that much time to work with. So you, she's kind of going to have to scramble for buckets. You know, then you could throw a late double team at her. You know what I mean? Now the, they wasted the whole shot clock. You know what I mean? So I think that would be the strategy I would take for them. Um, and obviously on offense, man, I don't believe they're going to be able to guard Iowa. Um, like I said, if, you know, you got Kate Martin, anybody that could just uh, go at their undersized guards. London Jones is like five foot four. Charisma Osborne, five nine. Um, Kiki Rice, she got some size on her. And I think she's the best defender they have on the perimeter. But, you know, she's still, you know, she's still the third um, smallest player on the court. So, I mean, on their team. So, yeah, I would, I would just, you know, do that. I think that would be a pretty good strategy. So, obviously, LSU and UCLA will have to play each other and whoever knocks each other out. I, I would prefer, I don't know. I don't know. I, I've been going back and forth with this, but I would pref I think I would prefer LSU, you know, because they're not as deep. They don't have just this clear mismatch in the post that Iowa seems to struggle with. Um, I think they can match up pretty well this year. I don't know. I don't know. Like I said, if, if you can, like, take Flaugie Johnson out of the game, if you can gain rebound and, and take away their clear uh, rebound positions. Because with Flaugie Johnson, she's able to get downhill. That's that's where she's most dangerous. And, you know, once she get there, she's, fit, she's doing all type of crazy layups to finish it. And um, Angel Reese, obviously, she cre her and her and Andy tomorrow, they create extra possessions. That's that's their main strength is because they can get the ball back, get the ball back, get the ball back on the offensive rebound, and that creates more possessions. So now you're you, you know initially they're not that efficient, but it's like because they get so many possessions, they're good. They can um, really run that offensive score up. So you know, and obviously on their defensive end too, you know, they're able to get out in transition. But I, I just like my chances better than, with that. Um, as far as South Carolina, I, I still have the same um, the same strategy. I think I broke that down pretty well. But what I didn't include is I think they should probably throw a zone in there, but get out on the shooters as well. You want them having to think through their offense, which really disrupt the rhythm of shooters. I know Caitlin Clark has experienced this as well. When Caitlin Clark, when they throw certain type of defenses at Caitlin Clark, like a box and one, or they just, you know, face guarding her or whatever, it takes her longer to figure out how to beat this defense. When you're thinking about how to beat a defense rather than how to get a clean look off because you know, you know, you already got advantages so you could just get, you know, your shot off freely, it makes you overthink and that really disrupts the rhythm of a shooter. So I would say, you know, I, I would throw a zone in there at them. Um... I think if you watch, if you go back to South Carolina game against Georgia, they did a really good job throwing that zone. I would do something similar like that. If you if you all want to go back and watch that game against South Carolina with Georgia, so that's it for this one, guys. Um, yeah, that's just my voiceover, and the video will continue from here. If Iowa is to go far, there will need to be a lot going in their favor. With the unfortunate loss of Molly Davis, more minutes have been devoted to the likes of Sydney Fulcher, Kylie Fairbach, and Taylor McCabe who I've been advocating for playing time since the last offseason. These players have been contributing significantly, and a player like Addison O'Grady has been playing well. I think in the Nebraska championship game, she was very critical in limiting Alexis Markowski because Markowski couldn't overpower her in the post. I think Lisa Bluter should take note of this and, be, and not be so reluctant to go to her when they clearly are at a disadvantage down low and aren't able to offset that with better offense. Lastly, Caitlin Clark has been in a bit of a shooting slump, but that game against Nebraska may have put an end to that and turned her up a bit. If she is able to regain her shooting rhythm, then this team may be a welcome surprise to Iowa fans and a devastating curveball to her detractors.